welcome to Tanya 200. We're beginning chapter 17, where the Rebbe answers the question with which he started the entire Tanya, and that is, what is it that makes it very close to our hearts to be able to serve God with our hearts, which means with love and fear? It would seem, the Rebbe says, that the nature of our hearts uh, do not permit, at least easily, do not permit the, the service of God with emotion, with love and fear, because the heart tends to have a non-godly, a more, a more selfish love and fear. And since this statement that Moses made to the people uh, is part of Torah, recorded in the Torah, and the Torah is eternal, then we can't dismiss the statement as being true of those days. That the people who came out of Egypt, they saw the miracles, they, were, they saw the splitting of the sea, and they were there when God spoke at Mount Sinai. So for them, it was very close to their hearts to serve God. That can't be the explanation because every word in Torah is eternally relevant and for all generations, so it must be true of our generation as well. And we find that our hearts are not easily inclined to loving God or fearing God. Another problem with the statement is that the Gemara, the sages say that it's one of the characteristics of the tzaddik it is one of the characteristics of the saintly that they are in control of their heart. Which means that if you're not a saint, you're not in control of your heart. So how can we say that it's easy or close, natural, for every person to serve God with the heart when not every person is a tzaddik, not every person is a saint? Now if we look at the statement itself, the phrase that Moses used, he said it is very close to you in your mouth and in your heart to do. So we assume that he's talking about three things. The mouth meaning speech, the heart meaning emotions, and to do means actions. Tanya says that the heart to do are really connected. What Moshe is talking about is that part of the heart that is necessary for the doing. In your heart to do means that part of your heart that is necessary for the action. Which means that even if it's not a full-fledged emotion, even if what you're feeling is not a palpable emotion in the revealed part of the heart, but rather a conviction in the recesses of the heart, it's more of a quiet uh, uh, non-excited emotion, but it is an emotion, it is in the heart. And that's what's necessary to animate the behavior, to produce the behavior and give it life. That part of the heart is very close to, act to the average person to be able to serve God with that kind of a love and that kind of a fear, which is a conviction of love and a conviction of fear. Now, why is that very close to every person? Because every person can use his mind. If he has any intelligence at all, he can use his intelligence, and every person is in control of his intelligence, he can use his intelligence to produce this conviction. So since your mind is always in your control, even if you're not a tzaddik, even though your heart is not in your control, but your mind is, therefore, using your mind, you can produce the conviction that is necessary for the action of the mitzvah. Now, another step. Every person is in control of his mind, and therefore is capable of thinking or, or contemplating whatever subject he chooses. But if you're not in control of your heart, how does this 
contemplation, how does this understanding get to the heart to produce the conviction? The answer for that is that by nature, as we've talked earlier, that by nature the mind controls the heart. So the heart will go where the mind leads by nature, human nature, which means even if you're not a tzaddik, even if you're not a saint, your nature permits, allows, for the influence of the mind over the heart. So we have two steps now. <clears throat> Since your mind is under your control at all times, even if you're not a tzaddik, therefore you can contemplate any subject you choose. Secondly, when you contemplate a subject, it is natural, even for the non-tzaddik, that the mind influences the heart and moves the heart to where the heart should be. So to produce this conviction of the heart is perfectly natural because the mind is in your control and the heart is in the control of the mind. There is a problem with the truly wicked. The sages say that the tzaddik is in control, has mastered his heart, but the wicked is under the control of their heart. In other words, they have no influence over their heart at all. Their heart controls them. So this seems to be an exception to the rule that it's not close for everybody to serve God with their heart. What if you're a, a really wicked, sinful person and you are now under the control of your heart? So the Rebbe says that that is in fact an exception. Th these people are not included in the statement, it is close to your heart to do, but they are such an exception, they're such a tiny minority that it, they can't be considered and therefore the statement remains a true statement. It is a general rule that every person can serve God with his heart. The exceptions are just too small, too insignificant to, um, to compromise that rule. What is it about the wicked person? There are some people who are so sinful that they completely lose control over themselves and they no longer sin out of a pursuit of pleasure, which is what, what it was at the beginning, they have become enslaved to the sin itself, even when the pleasure is gone. And so obviously they've lost all control and are now governed by the habit of sin rather than the desire or the pleasure of sin. These, these, uh, this condition, the sages describe as the living dead. Because they've lost all control, they're considered dead even while they're still alive. And so when Moses made that statement about the nature of people, he didn't include this exceptional condition, which comes from being very sinful, and the loss of control is not even a natural thing, it's more like a punishment for their sin. So, it is still true that, that the average person can serve God with his heart. These people are not average. What about the person who has sinned so badly that he has lost control? Of these people, it is true that they cannot serve God. Even a lesser sinful person who hasn't lost all control, but he has indulged in a sinful life, also can't serve God. It's not true of this person that it is very close to you to serve God with your heart. Of course, he can do the mitzvah, but not with the heart. In order for this person to be able to serve God with his heart, he first has to do tshuva. In other words, he can't just begin to do the good, he has to break the hold of the unholiness that has gripped him in order to free himself so that his heart is once more available for good things. 
What does it mean to free yourself? The sages say that tshuva, meaning regret, is associated with broken hearted. When a person regrets what he did or what he's been so deeply that he becomes broken hearted in a biblical, not, not in a psychological sense, but in a, in a biblical sense, broken hearted means that your regret is so real and so intense that it breaks the, the unholiness that has influenced the heart up until now, releasing the heart to be available to goodness. And this is described in, the, in Kabbalah as the lower level tshuva, because tshuva, which is translated as repentance, Tshuva means to return. It's not starting something new. It's not turning over a new leaf. It's a return. Going back to the way things were when we were innocent. Going back to the way things should have been all along. It's a return rather than a new beginning. But in this return, in Tshuva, there are two levels. There is what is called the higher level Tshuva, Tshuva ila, and then there's the lower level tshuva, tshuva tata. Hasidus says that the, uh, the word tshuva itself is really a composite word, and it can be understood or translated as toshuv hey. Instead of tshuva, it's toshuv hey which means return the he, the letter he. The Hebrew letter he appears twice in God's name. The first is called the big he, and the second is called the smaller he, the lower he. The first he refers to the neshama, to the soul, as it is in heaven. The second he describes the soul as it has come down into the body. The soul that has come down into the body is capable of sinning. The soul as it stands in heaven, obviously, is not capable of sinning. So what does it mean to return the hay? It means when the lower hay has fallen into bad habits, into sinful behavior, you need to return it. Because even though it's not the soul that sins, but it is that part of the soul that's in the body that gets locked into the sin, that gets imprisoned by, by the unholiness of the sin. It becomes surrounded by this iron curtain, a phrase used in, in, uh, in the Kabbalah, an iron curtain that separates the neshama from her father in heaven. It separates that part of the soul that's in the body from God. So to release the soul, to elevate that soul, to return it to its original freedom and innocence, <clears throat> you have to break it out of this klipa, the shell of holiness, that's, of unholiness, that surrounds it, that has built, it, built itself up around the neshama, around the soul. So the lower level tshuva means returning the lower hay, the hay that falls into that that fell into into the sin. How do you do that? What breaks this iron curtain? What uh, removes this uh, obstruction that separates the soul from God? the unholiness, or particularly the arrogance of the unholiness that the sin produces. How do you break that? By being brokenhearted. When a person is brokenhearted, which means that he regrets, and in a sense resents, the unholiness of the sin that he committed, that resentment and that regret destroys the arrogance that the sin had created. And once the arrogance is, is taken out of it, it falls apart. 
because unholiness doesn't have a true substance. It has only an arrogant uh, existence. When it's not arrogant, it falls apart. So when you've deflated it, when you've taken out the arrogance, you've also taken out its, its power and its existence. So brokenhearted doesn't mean depressed. Brokenhearted doesn't mean you hate yourself. Brokenhearted means you hate the unholiness that has built itself up around your soul as a result of the sin. And that's why a brokenhearted prayer, a brokenhearted plea for forgiveness is always answered and the forgiveness is always available. So a, a person who has sinned can't directly begin to serve God with his heart because his heart really is not available to him. It's locked away in this unholiness. So before he can begin to serve God with his heart, there's a necessary step, a preparation that he needs to make to free himself so that he is once again, like everyone else, able to serve God with his heart uh, easily, naturally, without uh, superhuman efforts. And that preparation is tshuva. The, the hay, which we said represents the soul, but there's the lower hay and there's the higher hay. The lower hay represents the soul that is in the body, and the higher hay represents the soul that remains beyond the body, surrounds the body, uh, transcends the body, and therefore is, in a sense, still in heaven. There's a higher level tshuva, which a person does even if he hasn't sinned, to return the soul to God, even though it hasn't fallen into unholiness, but it has come into the world, it has been created, been, it's been born, and although it's not contained within the body, it is still committed to the body or associated with the body, uh, which the body which it transcends. So even that is a descent for the soul, and it has moved away from its original godly state before it was associated with any body. So there's a form of tshuva where you return even the higher he, the higher part of the soul, and you reunite it with God. And this also comes through the fulfillment of mitzvahs, uh, with a greater enthusiasm, with a greater devotion than, uh, than ordinarily. And this is one of the really important, significant concepts which needs to be uh, revived or, or repeated. And that is that by doing a commandment, by fulfilling any of the mitzvahs, blowing the shofar on Rosh Hashanah, eating matzah on Pesach, lighting the Hanukkah candle, lighting the Shabbos candle, going to the mikveh, putting on the tefillin, any mitzvah brings you closer to God himself. It's not just that it makes you better. It's not just that, it, that by doing the mitzvah you deserve a reward. It brings you closer to God. What does that mean? The soul was very close to God before it was born. The godly soul is a piece of God from above that is breathed into us. So it was a part of God, it remains a part of God. Why does it need to do a mitzvah to be close to God? And as many Jews will, will say, I am Jewish even if I don't fulfill the commandment, so how significant can the commandment be? When we say that the commandment brings you closer to God, it doesn't mean closer than the body is. It doesn't mean closer to God than human nature is. It means closer to God than the soul was before it came down in the body. Because while the soul was in heaven, being a literal piece of God, it couldn't do mitzvahs. 
there are no commandments, there are no observances in heaven because you don't have matzah and you don't have a shofar and you don't have candles and you don't have a body to go to the mikveh with. So in heaven, the soul can't do mitzvahs. And therefore, there is a part of God that is unavailable to the soul while it's in heaven. It's as if a child is living at home very close, very, very connected to the father and mother, but there's a room in the house that they're not, that they're not invited, that they can't go into. There's the, the, the private room that the father or mother have that the child can't enter. So there's something about God that the soul can't touch while it's in heaven. When it comes down to earth, and God comes down to Mount Sinai and gives us the commandments, now we have access to that part of God which was unavailable to us in heaven. That's why when we do a mitzvah, we get close to God. Closer than a soul in heaven. Which means that these mitzvahs that God gives us is such a profound intimate, personal part of God that even a soul in heaven can't get it. Can't get that close. So the mitzvah must mean something so personal, so essential to God himself that it takes creation and God coming down to Mount Sinai and thousands of years of experience, of observance, in order for us to fully appreciate how divinely divine a mitzvah is. Something that a soul in heaven cannot understand or, or accomplish. So a mitzvah, let's say the mitzvah of Shabbos, or the mitzvah of Matzah, can't be a good uh, behavior, a good practice that benefits the human being, the body, the society. And that's why God asked us to do this, because it's good for us. There's got to be much more to the mitzvah than that. Because the mitzvah gets us closer to God than we would be if we had no body at all, if we were not physical at all. So the mitzvah must mean that this is so personal, so uh, intimate to God himself that when he gives us the mitzvah, we are invited and given the opportunity through the mitzvah to touch God in a way that a soul cannot while in heaven. And that's why the word mitzvah literally means connection. When we do a mitzvah, we are connected. But how does that work? Again, conventional wisdom says, if God gives you a commandment and you observe it, you're connected. By being obedient, God said, stand up. And you stand up, that's the connection. God said and you did. But that's a very shallow connection. Then you're connected in your obedience, but you're not really connected to him. And in terms of obedience, the soul was certainly more obedient in heaven than we will ever be on earth. Because in heaven, it didn't even have freedom of choice. And here, we have freedom of choice. So we can be disobedient. So when we say that the mitzvah connects you to God, it must mean two things. It must mean, number one, that the mitzvah touches a part of God that nothing else can touch. So when you do the mitzvah, you are connected to a part of him that is otherwise not available. Secondly, it must also mean that the mitzvah affects you, a part of you that cannot be reached any other way. Then, when the essence of you is connected to the essence of God, that deserves the title mitzvah. That we can call a connection. 
But the fact that there's a commander and you obey the command, that's nice, but that's not a profound connection. So if the mitzvah is not essential to God, then the fact that you obey him in doing the mitzvah doesn't bring you any closer to his essence, because the mitzvah is not essential. So if I make up some kind of a thing and I tell my children to do something just because I want to see them behave, I want to teach them discipline, and I, I ask them to do something I don't need and I don't really care about, it's just good for them, we're not going to get any closer. The children are not going to feel deeply connected to me. It's artificial, it's superficial, it's a good discipline, but there's nothing personal about it. So we're not getting any closer. I'm just doing my job, they're doing their job, and, and we're both responsible. But there's nothing intimate about it. So when, when the Torah says that a commandment is a mitzvah, which means not just an order, but also a connection, an attachment, here we're talking about something much more personal, much more essential than, uh, than following orders. The commandment is so essential to God himself that when we can connect ourselves to the mitzvah, we are automatically connected to the essence of God, something that he could not express to a soul, a peace of God while it's in heaven.